this microphone. I turned it on for okay, you. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yes. All right, let's get started with the last session for the day. So we're glad to continue with Xu Heng Shao telling us more about non-invertible symmetries, and we'll see if he's found any more models of the icing models since yesterday. <laughs> I'll try my best. Uh, all right, Every, everyone can hear me well? Good. Okay, so last time we talked about the relation between the Marana CFD and the icing CFD. They are related by gauging the fermion parity of the Maharana CFD. <clears throat> now, there are two symmetries that are important in the game. In Maharana CFD, there was a minus one to the F. By itself, it's free of any anomaly, and therefore, you can gauge it. After you gauge it, by definition, it's no longer a global symmetry in the gauged theory, aka Ising model in this case. However, in 1 plus 1D, Whenever you gauge the Z2, you gain another Z2. It's sometimes known as the dual or quantum Z2 symmetry. As John correctly pointed out, this is not really the standard dual Z2 symmetry as discussed by Vafa in the 80s. It's some fermionic version thereof. Let me now work out the details, but the upshot is that the Z2 global symmetry of the icing is dual to the fermion parity. They are not the same. They never coexist. They are dual to each other. On the Maharana CFT, there's a minus one to the F left. This two has an anomaly together. Last time we saw the anomaly manifested as a minus sign in the algebra in the Ramon Hilbert space. The minus sign looks like, looks like a mod two anomaly, but in fact, this anomaly is mod eight, meaning that you have to take eight copies of the Maharana fermions to trivialize the anomaly. I'm not going to talk too much about the eight, but I just want to make a quick comment that there's a number eight in the story. In fact, this eight is related to the critical space-time dimension of superstring theory in light quantization. Now, because there's an anomaly between minus one to the F and minus one to the F left, something funny happens to minus one to the F left. And minus one to the F left become, and I reserve my right to what it means by become, the non-invertible symmetry. which obeys this algebra. All right, now let's continue the discussion. And this time, um, this time I will give a very explicit expression for the non-invertible symmetry from the transverse field Ising model point of view. So we have transverse field. Ising model. On a closed chain. And index J is always identified with J plus N. N is the number of sites on this lattice. And we have a 2 to the N dimensional Hilbert space. On every site, we have a two dimensional Hilbert space, spin up and spin down. 
the Hamiltonian is given by this. The Z2 symmetry up there is just a product <coughs> of the Zj, and it's always a symmetry of the Hamiltonian. Now, at g equals to 1, there's actually an additional conserve operator. Namely, it comes with the Hamiltonian. And that's the one I'm going to write down. I'm not going to give you the details on how to derive this operator. <coughs> it's, it will basically be uh, imitating what we discuss in the continuum. But I'm not going to tell you the step. This discussion is hopefully just to, uh, it, the, the goal of this discussion is just to give you a very explicit expression for the lattice counterpart of our non-invertible symmetry in the continuum. <clears throat> so I'm going to define this operator in the following way. There's a phase that's not terribly important for the rest of the discussion, but it's a convenient normalization. So far, this there's still something else. So far, this operator is completely invertible. I'm going to I leave some space here, so I'm going to fill that in, in just a moment. So far, this operator is invertible. In fact, it's unitary. It's easy to check that each little factor here is unitary. However, this object, first of all, it's not translationally invariant. You see, I pick a reference point on my periodic chain. The first sight is somehow important, uh, somehow special compared to the others. Second of all, it doesn't commute with the Hamiltonian for any value of g. Now, there's a way to remedy this. You just multiply it by a z2 projection operator. And I'm just going to tell you the property of this operator. It commutes with the Hamiltonian only for uh, g equals to 1, the critical point. Something obvious is that if you multiply the z2 operator with d, that's the same as multiplying from the other side, and since you have, have, it, it has the z2 projector, the z2 operator will be absorbed by, by it. Okay, This is the obvious part. The more interesting part is that when you multiply d with itself, we're kind of anticipating to recover this algebra. I don't, I don't expect this is something you can do in your head. Um, but also know that I use different font between that d and this d, because they are not exactly the same. What you find is this. This piece is completely expected, because you have a projection operator. If you multiply the projection with itself, you get a projection. The second piece is the non-trivial part. It involves the lattice translation operator. So T here is the operator that translates your spin by one side. So there are two differences between this operator and the one in the continuum. First, there's a, fac there's a factor of two. You might say that the factor of two is just a normalization. We are on the lattice. This is an operator. No one can stop me from redefining the operator by a, square root, a, a factor of square root two, and that is true. So don't worry too much about the factor of two on the lattice. But the important thing is that there's a lattice translation on the right-hand side. So this operator even though it's a symmetry of the Hamiltonian, it's not quite an internal symmetry on the lattice. It mixes with the lattice translation. In fact, it's trying its very best to be a half lattice translation because it squares to the unit lattice translation. But it's not quite a half lattice translation 
because it squares to the lattice translation times a projector. In fact, it's, it's kind of, it's a weird half lattice translation because it even has a kernel because of the projector. However, as you go to, as you take G to be one, and you take the thermodynamic limit, most of the low-lying states will have very small eigenvalues with respect to the continuum momentum generator. In, in other words, if you focus on the low-lying state in the thermodynamic limit, T is approximately one. So for the low-lying state in the thermodynamic limit, this factor is essentially is gone. And then you can identify this D with that D in that limit. So for the low-lying state, the n goes to infinity limit, this d is 1 over root 2, the continuum d, that's e to the 2 pi i p, where, let me remind you, p is the conformal spin operator in the continuum, divided by 2n. Let me just emphasize that this is the lattice operator. Lattice. Uh, and this is the continuum. And this relation is exact on the lo low lying state. There's no 1 over n correction. Now, if you still remember Nati's lectures from the first week, um, such a symmetry in that terminology is an eminent symmetry because it. it emanates from the lattice translation. And in this particular case, the non-invertible symmetry of the Ising CFD is a non-invertible eminent symmetry. In any case, there's an explicit expression out there, and you can check the algebra if you want to. And that gives you a very explicit realization um, of the construction over there. All right. So that's pretty much all I want to say about the Ising model. At this point, any question? Great. So we can. Oh yes. So the, I guess the first, the first example was the, like the trivial example of the non-invertible symmetry you gave us, which is the projection. Right. This d, I guess d squared is projection. This g squared is projection. That was, like that's what makes it non-trivial. Well, the the reason that it's non-trivial is because, well, d by itself in d is it's not a projection. You can take this part or this part individually. That would be invertible. But neither of them is a symmetry. And you really have to add them up to be a symmetry of the Hamiltonian. So that's, in that sense, it's different from the stupid example I gave in the first lecture, where the individual piece 1 and eta are both symmetries of the Hamiltonian. Here, you really have to take the superposition. Sorry, I forgot to repeat the question. The question was, <laughs> uh, how is it different from the most trivial non-invertible symmetry, namely the projection? And the reason is because you have to add them up to be a symmetry, and that's different from the case of projection. Yes? So I understand that just the trivial projection, um, you shouldn't really think of Well, not quite. Oh, OK, I see what you mean. So the question was, if you are an icing CFT person, and you just stare at this equation, and then you say, well, OK, maybe D seems to obey the same uh, algebra uh, as 1 plus eta. However, the way it actually acts is slightly different. Um, and you can see that from the way that D acts on epsilon. So even though you obey the same algebra as the, as the projection operator, maybe to, um, you have to rescale it by some appropriate factor, but the, the way it acts on the local operators are different, and particularly acts differently on the thermal operator, epsilon. Uh, 
You mean on the lattice, or sorry, or in the continuum? Yeah, on the last line. Um, the line. So here, indeed, if you want, you can absorb the square root two to the left hand side. I have no strong opinion about it. There is a sense that it's more natural to normalize it this way because of the fermionic picture. But as an operator, there's nothing stop from you to do that. Okay. Um, any other questions? All right. Okay, then we can finally graduate from the 1 plus 1D Ising model. Um, there's one thing that I really wanted to talk about, but I don't have time, so I'll just say in words. So we, we spent a lot of time talking about all these symmetries. Um, but what are they good for? Uh, it turns out that there are a lot of interesting applications of these generalized global symmetries, and in particular, non-invertible symmetries, that can teach you something new about all quantum systems. In particular, many of the non-invertible symmetries have some kind of Tehuv anomaly. One consequence of the Tehuv anomaly is that it's incompatible with the trivially gap phase. And therefore, if you can identify such a non-invertible global symmetry in the UV system, then it helps you constrain the low energy phase. It helps you constrain the RG flow. In particular, the icing category, this D, curly D we were saying, this one has an anomaly. It's impossible to, real, to have a trivially gap phase compatible with this non-invertible symmetry. And that leads to an interesting application, which I'll just say briefly. So in 1 plus 1D, there's a famous flow known as the zomological flow. We can start with the tricritical icing CFD. This is a C equals to 7 tenths minimal model. It's the second unitary minimal model. And you turn on a relevant deformation. Where this operator is the least relevant operator. If you turn on this deformation with positive coupling, well, in some convention, this flows to the icing CFT. This is known as the zomological flow. It's the integrable flow. It's exactly solvable. This flow, you can check, preserve. So I should add one more thing. We have seen that the icing CFT has a non-invertible symmetry D. It's also true that the tricritical icing model has the same uh, non-invertible symmetry. And that non-invertible symmetry is preserved by this RG flow. If you turn on the same deformation, but with the opposite sign, it's known that this flow uh, goes to a gap phase. However, it's not a trivially gap phase. It's a gap phase with three degenerate ground state. And that makes you wonder where the three comes from. The flow preserves D and, of course, eta. Eta is a Z2 symmetry. So naively, you would say, OK, I have a Z2 symmetry. Z2 is spontaneously broken. I have two degenerate ground states. But then why didn't we get two? Why didn't we, uh, why, why, why we actually get three? And the reason is because this D, this non-invertible symmetry, first is incompatible with the trivially gap phase. And when it flows to a gap phase, the minimal number of ground states it is compatible with is three. So just by knowing this flow preserve this non-invertible symmetry, you know that you can only have the following two options. Either you get a CFT, a gapless point, that realizes the non-invertible symmetry, or you get a gap phase whose number of ground states has to be a multiple of three. Yes? Right, so the question was how does eta act on the degenerate ground state? It will swap two of them, leave one invariant. 
That's why if you only look at ADA, you would be surprised why there has to be an additional uh, um, invariance. It's not a contradiction, but it's not natural. But the existence of D explains that. Okay, so there are many such applications, uh, but here I, would, I just want to mention one. Any other questions? All right. Okay, so now um, I can also make some comments on other kind of non-invertible symmetries in 1 plus 1D, but in the interest of time, I, I might not do that. Because you see, in, the, in 1 plus 1D, we spent the last two lectures basically just talking about one kind of non-invertible symmetry, the one in Ising model. But there are many other kind of non-invertible symmetries in 1 plus 1D. In fact, in almost all the 1 plus 1D rational CFT, there is a non-invertible symmetry. So it's extremely rich. But let me not comment on that. So now we're going to higher dimensions, finally. Now, in higher dimensions, um, there has been kind of two developments on generalized global symmetries. So in this plot, if I take the origin to be the ordinary symmetry, there are kind of two different ways you can generalize uh, the ordinary global symmetry. In one direction, you, go, you, you consider the higher form symmetry. The higher form symmetries are usually uh, more interesting in higher than one plus one dimensions. The intuition is that it acts on extended objects. One plus one D is just too crowded. So it gets interesting when you go to a higher space time dimension. So let me add D in this axis. On the other hand, in one plus one D, this is one plus one, there are many non-invertible symmetries. And for a while, these two developments seem completely orthogonal to each other. Um, until recently, there has been, in the past few years, there has been a lot of new developments um, that arises from a very interesting interplay between higher form symmetry and non-invertible symmetry. And that's what we are going to discuss in the following. Essentially, there are two, um, I'm going to talk about two different ways to construct the non-invertible symmetries. These are not all the possible ways to construct non-invertible symmetries, but are two um, to, to very powerful construction. So the first one would be called higher gauging. Which unfortunately I will have to skip, but I'll just say in words what that roughly means. It means that if you are given a higher form symmetry, the first thing you can do is just to gauge the higher form symmetry in all of the space time. So throughout this school we have briefly uh, talk about how to gauge a higher form global symmetry. Maybe not, maybe not in a lot of details, but this is a thing you can do. If you gauge a higher form global symmetry, assuming that it doesn't come with a Tohoof anomaly, as usual, you go from one quantum system to another. But there's an alternative thing you can do, which is that you only gauge alone a higher co-dimension manifold. So pictorically, you have your quantum system here. And you do gauging only in some higher co-dimension manifold. And by doing so, you don't change the quantum system. If you're far away from where the action takes place, you don't see anything. But this gauging creates a topological defects in the original quantum system T. And that is generally non-invertible. And the resulting defect here goes under, the, goes under the name of condensation defect. 
But this is an extremely cheap way to obtain a non-invertible symmetry because the only input is your uh, higher form global symmetry. So in many ways, the condensation defects are like the projection. You take linear combinations of invertible global symmetry that you were given in the first place. The only difference is that now there's an interesting interplay between defects of different dimensionalities. Um, I can spend a whole lecture talking about condensation defect, but uh, I want to move on to something else. Later on, we will run into condensation defect, and at that point, I will comment on this more. But you should really think about the, higher, uh, the condensation defect from higher gauging as the simplest possible or the, even the most trivial uh, non-invertible symmetry. Uh, do I have space here? Kind of. Now, the second kind, which is more interesting, and that's the one that I'm going to spend uh, the rest of this lecture on, is called half gauging. that you gauge in half of the space time. So pictorically, you have T on one side, but on the other side, you gauge your global symmetry, and thereby changing the system on half of the space, half of the space time to be more precise. Generally, doing this gives you an interface between two different theory. But there, there will be special cases it gives you a non-invertible symmetry. So these are the two different ways to construct non-invertible symmetry. And um, I'm going to discuss the second one. The question was, when I say higher gauging, oh, no, half. oh half gauging, oh. Um, in, the question was, in half gauging, do I restrict myself to gauging invertible uh, higher form global symmetry? Is that right? Uh, I guess I have zero form. But... Oh, zero form, OK. Um, later on, we will see the restriction on the form degree that I would like to impose. Um, but the short answer is that for half gauging, of course, you can gauge um, non-invertible zero-form symmetry on one side, but that generally might not give you a non-invertible defect in a single theory. I, that will become clear in just a few mi minutes. Yes? So, I understand half of space time is so you probably mentioned zero and surface, not the space time itself. The question was how do we understand half of the space time? Uh, so, lo local, so this construction works locally around the defect. So you just literally take one of your coordinates to be x, and you gauge in x greater than 0, and do nothing in x less than 0. Later, I'm going to write down the explicit Lagrangian that does the job, and hopefully that will clarify things. But any other question? OK. All right, so half gauging. And now we are going to do in general space-time dimensions. But I will do, after I introduce the general idea, I will restrict to special dimensions, such as 1 plus 1 and 3 plus 1, to give examples. But bear with me with some general discussion. So let T be a QFT, let's say relativistic QFT, in these space-time dimensions. Um, I'm going to assume 
that it has a Q form global symmetry. A Q form for simplicity, let me assume it's Zn uh, global symmetry. I further need to assume it does not have an anomaly, that meaning that I can gauge it. Okay, so this is the setup. This is the input. Um, there could be, but uh, for now I'm going to focus on a single higher form global. Sorry, the question was can there be a mixed anomaly? Now the answer is that there could be, but I don't care. I'm only going to <laughs> focus on the Q form global symmetry by itself. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm only imposing that it does not have a self anomaly. Yes. So the question was, can Q be zero? And I will answer that in just a few minutes. The value of Q will be, be restricted later on for, for our purposes. All right. <coughs> oh, I have some space here. So because Z and Q is non-anomalous, we can gauge Z and Q to obtain a new quantum field theory, which I'll just denote by Z T modded out by Z and Q. Now in writing so, I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of ambiguities. So as many of you might know, when you gauge a global symmetries, there are options. And the options are commonly known as discrete torsion. And those options are important. I'm going to be vague about this, but in the explicit construction that I will talk about later on, uh, certain choices have to be made. Different choices will give you different outcome. But for uh, notation simplicity, I'm just going to write it as T mod Zn but there are additional choices that have to be made. All right. Now, what is the Lagrangian for this theory? We can write it in the following form. It has the original Lagrangian for T. T has a global symmetry Zn, so we can couple it to a Q plus one form gauge field, little a. Um, uh, in, in this lecture, all the lowercase fields are going to be dynamical. Uh, but we want to make it Zn. So we have to add OK, let me comment on a few things. First of all, at this point, I'm not doing half gauging. I'm just doing gauging in the usual sense. Now, don't worry about boundary condition. I'm gauging everywhere. Now, little a uh, in this notation is a U1 gauge field. How do you make a U1 gauge field Zn value? This was discussed in Ibu's lecture and was also briefly discussed in Sakura's lecture. The way to make little a is gauge field is to use a so-called BF action. You introduce an auxiliary field B of complementary form degree. By complementary, I mean this, this is D minus Q minus two plus one plus Q plus one has to be the total space-time dimension. And with a coefficient n over two pi. The sole purpose of life for B is that when you integrate it out, it restricts a to be a Zn value gauge field. Um, I hope that's clear. Um, I watched Ibu's lecture. I think he discussed the BF theory in quite some details. All right, so this is the Lagrangian for this gauged theory, which a priori is a different theory compared to the original one. Before I erase this, let me just make a, one, one comment. Last time after the lecture, many people asked me, what is eta? How do I think about eta as a dual symmetry from gauging a Z2? Uh, 
I was being too fast last time, um, but I think if I might have covered what, what it means to have a dual symmetry. But let me just uh, say again what it means, and that will nicely connect to the story up there. When you gauge a Z2 symmetry, the, Z2 be, uh, the, the resulting theory can be viewed as a Z2 gauge theory. Whenever you have a G gauge theory, by definition, you will have the Wilson lines associated with the gauge group. Wilson lines, by definition, are labeled by representation of the gauge groups. In this case, we have a Z2 gauge group. Representation of Z2 is isomorphic to Z2. You have a trivial representation, you have a sign representation. So in, in effect, you have one non-trivial Z2 Wilson line. Z2 is a discrete group, and therefore the Wilson line is topological. This is unlike the ordinary Wilson line in U1 QED. A topological line in 1 plus 1D implements a Z2, uh, a global symmetry for you, and that is eta. So in one sentence, eta being the dual symmetry is the Wilson line of the gauge symmetry. Now let's try to apply it to the theory T ma Zn. So in the theory T ma Zn, what is our gauge field? The gauge field is the little a. You can therefore use little a to construct the defect. You just integrate your a, which is a q plus 1 form, on some q plus 1 dimensional manifold. Thanks to the equation of motion for B, eta raised to the nth power is 1. OK. This is the symmetry operator for the dual, oops, for the dual z hat and D minus Q minus two form symmetry. Hat is just part of the name, so don't worry too much about it. The form degree uh, is important. So here, this defect um, is Q plus one dimensional, and that's associated with uh, D minus Q minus two form global symmetry. Yeah, I know it's hard to do this. <laughs> Subtraction in real time, but believe me, this is the correct answer. Okay. So, for instance, when d is 2, namely in 1 plus 1 d, and when q is 0, namely for ordinary zero form symmetry, 2 minus 0 minus 2, that's 0 again. And that's why in 1 plus 1 d, when you gauge a zero form symmetry, you gain another zero form symmetry back. Okay. In Ebo's lecture, he not only talk about this defect, he also talk about the defect associated with B. But we are not going to do that. The reason is because we, we are not talking about just the BF theory. Our BF theory is coupled to a more complicated quantum field theory T. The equation of motion for B is very simple. It tells you that A is a discrete Zn gauge field. However, the equation of motion for little a is more complicated. It doesn't tell us b is discrete topological z and gauge field. And therefore, if you write down the analogous defect for b, it's not going to be topological. In Ibu's lecture, he, doesn't, he didn't have the t. He, it's just a BF theory in isolation. And therefore, you have a pair of topological defect. Here, the coupling breaks one of them, but preserves the other. OK. All right, any questions so far? It's a little bit abstract, but I promise you later on I will give examples. Okay. Now, even though um, I was emphasizing on the coupling between the quantum system T and the BF theory, um, let, let's take a step back and consider the BF theory on its own. 
theory has two boundary conditions. Well, it has many more boundary conditions, but I'm, let me focus on two of them. It has a Dirichlet boundary condition where we set A. I might drop the, up, uh, the superscript for A and B sometimes, just too cumbersome. One boundary condition is just to set A to be zero on the boundary. The vertical line means the restriction of a form to the boundary. There's another boundary condition which you can call Neumann. The name uh, doesn't mean anything invariant where you set B to zero. Both of them are topological boundary condition in the BF action. Topological means that, let's say we set the boundary here at x equals to zero, where we set a to be zero. Then because of the equation of motion for b, any correlation function involving the two sides will necessarily be the same. So that's why it means that it's a topological boundary condition. You can deform the locus of the boundary a little bit. If it, if it doesn't pass through any local operator, you're not going to change any correlation function. Topological boundary condition typically arise from gap boundaries in microscopic lattice model, but not always. All right, any question? So here I drew the picture for the Dirichlet boundary condition. The same comment applies to the Neumann boundary condition, just swapping A with B. Yeah? Uh, it's not always a Lipschitz pressure. Fracton? Oh, fracton. <laughs> <laughs> I think in 2 plus 1, there are, I don't know. I think there are, there are also some very exotic examples. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I was being conservative in saying that not always. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, now we can finally talk about half gauge. And the idea is that on one side you have the origin of quantum field theory T, and you only gauge the quantum field theory on half of the space time. But what does that even mean? The meaning of that can be made precise by using the topological boundary condition over there. So as we said, T mod Zn is given by this Lagrangian. So you have all these little a and little b gauge fields on one side of the space time. But then you have to impose appropriate boundary conditions for this additional gauge fields. Here you have the original degrees of freedom for T. Here you have something at little a and little b. But to make the line here meaningful, you have to impose the boundary condition. The boundary condition we're going to impose is A being zero rather than B. And the distinction is important. The reason that the distinction is important is because in the couple system, the equation of motion for B is, unmod is not modified. It still say says that dA va n times dA vanishes. And therefore, this boundary condition is a topological boundary condition. Well, in this case, it's no longer a boundary condition. It's a boundary condition with respect to the little a gauge field. But now it becomes an interface between two different quantum systems. So I'm going to write it as a topological interface. I'm going to call this interface D, where D stands for defect or Dirichlet. Okay, let me make one comment. This interface is necessarily associated with a well-defined Hilbert space. So that was one of the principles we emphasized in the first lecture. Whenever we construct an interface, a boundary condition, or a defect, we can do it in Euclidean signature, but then we would like to, we would like to demand that once you pick a direction in time, it's associated with a well-defined Hilbert space. Here we started with a boundary condition, 
discussing Ibu's lecture that's associated with a well-defined Hilbert space in the presence of a boundary. Here we compose the boundary, or more precisely, we couple the BF theory to the quantum system T. Each constituent has a well-defined Hilbert space, and this will also give you a well-defined Hilbert space. So this will necessarily satisfy the principle we stated in the first lecture. Yeah, there was a question. Does that have to be a G con some G constant space? The question was, does this have to be some, uh, you mean x equals to zero constant slice? No. This can be any co-dimension one manifold. And that's related to the comment here. This is a topological boundary condition. You can deform it arbitrarily. So this is just some co-dimension one. Locally, you can take it to be x to be 0, where x is one of your space-time coordinates. OK, any question up to this point? So far, there's not much has happened. We're just saying that if t has a discrete higher form global symmetry, gauge it in half of the space-time, you get an interface between two different theories. But your original interest was, was to study t on its own. You don't care too much about the gauge theory. So how do we actually get a new symmetry of T? Um, oh, the other thing I want to emphasize is that here it's important we choose A to be 0. If we choose B to be 0, that's not topological. And it won't give you a topological interface. Okay. Before we go to the defect, let's draw a cartoon. So you have an interface here. You have T. You have the gauge theory here. You can also consider orientation reversal of the interface. So what this picture is saying is that you divide your space-time into three regions, and you only gauge in the intermediate region. Both D and D bar are topological, so you can bring this wall close to the other side. But as you do so, this region becomes very short. And it's like t and t are now separated by something called dimension 1. In the region here, we are gauging the symmetry in a co-dimension 0 region with two boundaries. Now that you collapse it into a co-dimension 1 manifold, that corresponds to the option number 1 there. Originally, we are gauging in a region. Now we are gauging in a co-dimension 1 manifold. And that's exactly higher gauging. And that gives you the condensation defect. So now I'm just going to write a very schematic equation. And pretty much all the non-invertible symmetry we will discuss in this series of lectures are, are of this form. In fact, you might have already recognized, oh, and I erase, that in icing CFT, the, the fusion rule is like this. In two dimensions, D and D bar are the same. Um, don't worry too much about the bar. It arises from a technical reason. It's not terribly important. It's important to get it straight, but it's not terribly important conceptually. In 1 plus 1D, D and D bar are the same. Now, what appears on the right-hand side in the, in the case of icing? That's just 1 plus eta. And that's consistent with the comment I gave earlier. You should think about condensation defect as a fancy version of the projection operator. And in 1 plus 1d, the condensation defect literally reduces to the, condens uh, to the projection, or more precisely, twice the projection. Later on, we will go to the more interesting higher dimensional theory, and I will write down an explicit expression for the condensation defect. Yes. The question was, uh, here I, I need the fact that this interface is topological, which stems from the fact that the equation of motion for B uh, tells us that this condition is topological. But do I need a similar condition for T? But I'm not sure what that means. On T, we don't have any, on the left side of the, 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 the system, there's no gauge field. 
I don't impose any boundary condition. Let me say it differently. The degrees of freedom for t is continuous across this interface. On the right hand side, I introduce additional degrees of freedom, little a and little b. And I'm only imposing boundary condition on the additional degrees of freedom I'm adding. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. The question was, do, do we know how to do it in the lattice model? And the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, in the paper where we first outlined this procedure on half gauging in the continuum, we have a separate section doing this explicitly on the lattice. Yes. In, in fact, the argument for the topological nature can be made most rigorous and precise on the lattice. Any other questions? Great. But even though this equation looks extremely similar to the Ising non-invertible fusion rule, there's an important difference that up to this point, D is not a defect in a single quantum system. D, as I emphasize, is an interface separating two different quantum systems. Indeed, the input is too cheap. I just assume there's a quantum field theory with a non-anomalous higher form global symmetry. Do I expect that any such quantum field theory has a non-invertible symmetry D? The answer is no. However, I should say that every such quantum field theory does have a non-invertible symmetry C. But as I told you, you should think about C as something really stupid. It's an analog of the projection. But having D as a symmetry is something precious. And that's what we are going to discuss now. <coughs> okay, so when, under what condition will this precious thing happen. It happens when the quantum system T is isomorphic to its gauge version. This doesn't happen every day, but it sometimes happens. And I will give examples when this happens. And this is not enough. We also have to identify the global symmetry when there's such an isomorphism. And the only global symmetry that I, I assume in the beginning is a Zn Q form global symmetry. There could be others, but they are not important in my discussions. And the only <coughs> global symmetry in the gauge theory is the quantum or dual symmetry. Let me say if. This doesn't always happen, but let's assume it happens. Now this equation only makes sense if Q is D minus two over two. Otherwise the form degrees don't even match. Okay. So example, when D is two, namely when we're in one plus one D, then we are talking about zero-form global symmetry. This can happen for zero-form global symmetry. Indeed, when you gauge a Z2 zero-form symmetry in 1 plus 1D, you gain a Z2 zero-form symmetry in the gauged theory. The next dimension this happens is when you go to four space-time dimensions, where if you gauge a one-form symmetry, you, you gain a one-form global symmetry back. And we can do analytic continuation. But let me focus on these two cases. When this is the case, then D becomes a co-dimension one topological defect in a single theory, T. And in the spirit, um, of the way we view generalized global symmetry these days, 
D becomes a generalized global symmetry. I have 20 minutes left? Okay, great. Okay. Now, two comments. First, as I said, since the, not the topological defect D is constructed out of a consistent boundary condition, it's necessarily uh, give you a well-defined defect associated with a well-defined Hilbert space. So it obeys our principle. Second remark, our starting point is that we have a Zn Q form global symmetry. Using the Zn Q form symmetry, we build this non-invertible symmetry under the condition here. And therefore, this D cannot exist without that Zn Q form symmetry. D is kind of subordinate to the Q form Zn global symmetry we started with. It's manifest from the way we construct it. It's also manifest in the fusion rule. In the fusion rule here, D times D bar will give you a condensation defect, which is made out of the Zn Q form global symmetry. If you somehow break the Zn Q form symmetry, then the right hand side doesn't make sense. And and the left-hand side cannot possibly make sense. And this is actually a very important lesson for non-invertible symmetry, that not all symmetries are on the same footing. Some symmetry, some symmetry are subordinate to others. And therefore, if you start with a quantum system with both D and the corresponding Z and Q form global symmetry, and you try to break them, you have to break them in the right order. It is impossible to break the Z and Q form symmetry while preserving D. And that eventually leads to various non-trivial constraints on the dynamics of the quantum system. Yeah. So in these cases, if you only want defect, you need uh, an even number of uh, uh, defects, right? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? If, if you only want which defect? Uh, condensation defects. Yeah. You always need an even number of defects. The question is, if I only want the condensation defects, do I have to have even number of Ds? Uh, for this, so D and D bar, strictly speaking, are different. Yeah. Um, there are more, the short answer is no. Yeah. Sometimes you can have three Ds fusing together give you the condensation defect. But that's related to the comment I say earlier, when you gauge a symmetry, there are options in the discrete torsion. In any case, when you, if you only want to talk about the condensation defect, you can forget about this half-gauging story. You just have to take the Q-form symmetry, gauge it along a higher co-dimension manifold. Yes. Uh, uh, ah, good. The question was, how do you see that D will act non-trivially on something? Um, let me see if I want to make that comment here. That, that's, a, that's a great question, because I'm actually going to use that later on. Mm, let me not make that comment here. And when I get to the example, I will come back to this question. And remind me if I forgot. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, are there any situations where we have two uh, symmetries? One is Q form, and the other is Q minus Q minus Q form. And then once we gauge both of them, we get the same pair. Great question. So the question was, could it be, here I restrict myself when G is a single factor of Zn of a fixed form degree. Could it be that you start with a global symmetry that involves a higher form symmetry of different form degree, such that when you gauge both of them, they got swapped and then identified together? The answer is yes. Uh, and there are such examples in 2 plus 1D. So here you see we jump from 2 to 4. In 2 plus 1D, you can start with a, Zn0 form symmetry times a Zn1 form symmetry. And we, when you gauge both of them, they got swapped. And it could be that they are isomorphic to each other. And then you get similar defect. For simplicity, I restrict myself to a single factor of Zn here. OK. Um, now, coming back to the fusion rule, d times d bar is the condensation. There's another. Uh, fusion rule that I would like to mention, which is D times eta. Now, what is eta? Eta is the Wilson line for the gauge fields we added to the right-hand side. 
but A is zero on the boundary. So when you times D, when you multiply D with eta from the right, it becomes trivial. In the case when D is a defect, namely in the case when this condition is satisfied, you can run the argument backwards. You can view this as the original system and this as the, well, actually, um, generally, uh, you, you can also view this as the gauge theory of this guy. And you will have an eta hat on this side. Yeah, sorry, there was a question. Uh huh. Yes. 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 Right. So the question was: Is it always the case that D, in some sense, contains a projection operator, so that this relation is true? The first comment is that not all non-invertible symmetries are of this form. There are non-invertible symmetries that just has nothing to do with the invertible symmetry whatsoever. Then the question uh, cannot even be defined. Now, when you do have such a fusion rule, the short answer is I don't really know. And it, it, there might not be a universal answer. It might depend on how you realize the system microscopically. In that microscopic realization, you see the explicit factor of the projector. But in other microscopic realization, that might not necessarily be the case. In any case, here, the half gauging construction make this two fusion rule manifest. All right. Uh, any question for the general discussion? All right. If not, let's try to uh, make this discussion more concrete by doing examples. So we're going to do, I guess, three examples. The first example is in D equals to 2, D equals to 0. And we're going to take T to be the icing conformal field theory. And it's important that it's the CFT point. When you are at the CFT point, it is invariant under gauging the Z2 symmetry. One way to understand it is that there's only one unique unitary minimal model of central charge one half. So if you gauge it, you have to go back to itself. So that's an that's a example where this condition is satisfied. And in that case, the condensation defect, as I emphasized, is just one plus eta. Because what are, what are we doing? The zero form global symmetry is implemented by a line defect in one plus one dimensions. If you want to gauge the form symmetry in the whole two-dimensional space-time, you insert the line, you wrap the line around all possible cycles. If you remember from Efine's lecture on the torus, when you gauge the Z2, you sum this fourth diagrams together. So you pick a torus and you wrap uh, all of its, uh, and you consider all possible uh, insertion of your Z2 line around its cycles. Condensation defect arises from higher gauging. It means that you pick a line, you pick a line in your two-dimensional space-time, and you only gauge it there. But the co-dimension one manifold, the line you pick, has the same dimensionality as the symmetry operator eta and one. So the best thing you can do, the only thing you can do, is to do the literal sum. And that's why condensation defect is a generalization of the projection. In, two, in 1 plus 1 d, d is the same as d bar. So d times d is 1 plus eta. And we have the other fusion rule that becomes manifest from the higher gauging picture. Okay. 
Now, there was a question about how it acts on operator. How do I know if D acts on anything at all? One advantage of the higher gauge, in, uh, the half gauge in picture is that it tells you what happens when you bring um, a local operator or even some extended object past the topological co-dimension one topological defect D. So let's do it here. Let's say you start with a sigma operator. Sigma is a thin operator that's odd under the Z2 global symmetry. Half gauging construction tells you that on this side of the defect, which is the original icing CFT, but on the other side, we gauge the Z2. So as you bring the line past the older operator sigma, the sigma will be experiencing through a Z2 gauging. What happens when you gauge uh, uh, the Z2 symmetry, um, what happens to the sigma when you gauge the Z2 symmetry? Sigma is charged under the Z2 global symmetry. When you gauge a global symmetry in a quantum system, anything that's charged will now will no longer be a local operator by definition. They are no longer gauge invariant, and the only way to make sense out of them in the gauge theory is that now they are attached to, to the Wilson line. Just like in QED, electron lives at the end of the Wilson line. So as sigma goes through the defect, it now has to be attached to the Wilson line, which we said is nothing else but the eta line. And what lives at the end of the eta line is the disorder operator mu. So this is the other advantage of the half gauging. It makes it manifests how the older operator transforms. Any question? Oh, I thought there was a question. OK, so that's the first example. What, what this picture means in terms of correlation functions? In terms of correlation function. But what is the more precise like, uh, way of thinking, bringing together? And, like, uh, ah. Is that like the oh. correlation function yeah. does not change? Right, right. So the question was, what does this equality mean yeah. in terms of the correlation function? So strictly speaking, I cannot move sigma because sigma is a non-trivial operator with scaling dimension. So you, the meaning is that you hold sigma fixed and you bring the line pass through sigma. And the statement is that as you bring it past sigma, uh, any correlation function involving this patch and that patch will necessarily be identical. Pictorically, it's easier to draw it this way, although I should put sigma and mu in the same horizontal position. Yeah? Twisted boundary condition. I, I'm not sure if I understand the question. So when we do half gauging, we impose a boundary condition for the gauge field in half of the space time. Sorry, I, I think I misremembered how this works. Okay. In this twisted boundary condition, the Z2 even states are sigma and mu. So then, then half gauging is also still swapping. So it's always swapping sigma and mu. That's right. The D non-invertible symmetry always swaps mu and sigma. Yes. The question was, can you read the equality backwards? And the answer is yes. So you, you, you move it over here, and then as it pass, well, strictly speaking, again, you have to move the line D. As you go from here, the eta becomes shorter and shorter, and as it passes through, it just disappears. Uh, the question was whether the half gauging doesn't give me a new non-invertible symmetry, but help me identify the non-invertible symmetry. Well, I, I, that depends on what you mean by new, right? Yeah, I mean, in this case, indeed, we already knew that there's a non-invertible symmetry D, and half gauging gives an alternative construction. 
That's correct, yeah. So in fact, in the next example, I will talk about the non-invertible symmetry was discovered this way. For the Ising case, D was known for a long time. And then um, there was an interpretation in terms of half gauging. But for other systems, it was the other way around. Okay, I have five minutes left, which I think is just enough for me to talk about the other examples. So finally, we can talk about an example in higher dimensions. So four dimensions, one form symmetry. <coughs> and the theory will be the U1 free gauge theory, the free Maxwell theory. No charge matter. You literally just have 1 over 4 e squared. F mu nu, F mu nu. But I promise you tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, no, the day after tomorrow, we will talk about an interacting higher dimensional theory. But today, let's, uh, as a warm up, let's talk about the free theory. It's a capital U1, meaning that it's a compact gauge group. It's convenient to write tau as 4 pi i over e squared. Sometimes people don't care about the e. When, we, when it comes to the free Maxwell theory, because it doesn't enter into any local correlation function. For our purposes, however, it will be important. You should view the 4D Maxwell theory as a conformal field theory with an exactly marginal deformation tau. We can also turn on the theta angle, but let me not do it here. Turning on the theta angle is, is extremely interesting, give you new non-invertible symmetry, but I'm not going to discuss it in the lectures. Free Maxwell theory, as discussed by Thomas, has an electric one-form symmetry times a magnetic one-form symmetry. And John also reviewed that uh, today and yesterday. We're not going to use all of them. You could, you'll get more interesting results. But let's let me focus on a Zn one-form symmetry, subgroup of the electric one-form symmetry. Now, what happens if I gauge this Zn one-form symmetry? What happens is that you are basically rescale your capital gauge, uh, your gauge field A by a factor of n. If you rescale your gauge field by a factor of n, that's the same as scaling your E by a factor of n. Gauging the electric one-form symmetry and the magnetic one-form symmetry does something opposite. In one case, you multiply E by n. In the other case, you divide E by n. So the net effect is that you, it takes tau to tau over n squared. So gauging the electric one-form symmetry in the free Maxwell theory generally does not leave the theory invariant. It maps one value of your exactly marginal deformation tau to, a, to another one. <coughs> OK? However, this is one element. However, in Maxwell, free Maxwell theory, there's an S-duality. S-duality is the statement that the Maxwell theory at value tau is isomorphic to the Maxwell theory at value minus 1 over tau. And under the S-duality, the Wilson line and the two-hoof line got exchanged. By combining the two elements, then there's a trick you can play to achieve the goal, the condition we have over here. So for generic value of tau, we don't have a uh, self-duality under gauging. But when tau is i times n, 
then you start with i n. You first do gauging the Z n one form symmetry subgroup of the electric one form symmetry. You get tau over n square, and then you do s duality. But now it goes back to itself. So that tells you that max at tau equals to i times n, there's a non-invertible symmetry. And the non-invertible symmetry arises from half gauging, and its fusion rule is of the following form. Here, m is the three manifold that you choose to place the non-invertible defect. It's the co-dimension one manifold, say x equals to zero. If you fuse d times d bar, it equals the condensation defect. And now I'm going to give you an explicit expression for the condensation defect. It's one over n, and you take a sum over all the two cycles of the three manifold with the n coefficient and eta of s. So let's unpack this formula a little bit. We have a Zn one form symmetry in three plus one dimensions. It's implemented by a topological surface operator. Right? So one form symmetries are implemented by co-dimension two operator slash defect in space time. Where in three plus one D, co-dimension two means they are surfaces. And that's what I meant by eta supported on some two manifold. And eta raised to the nth power is one. In the Ising case, d times d is just one plus eta. Everyone has the same dimensionality. Here, d was constructed as a co-dimension one interface when you do half gauging. So it's a three-dimensional object. Eta is a two-dimensional object implemented the one-form symmetry. So how can you have an equality relating the fusion between two three-dimensional defect and some two-dimensional defect. The answer is that you have to sum over all possible insertions of this two-dimensional topological defect over the two cycles of the three manifolds where D is supported on. So it gives you a much more involved fusion rule compared to the Ising case. But it really comes from the same physical reasoning. I'm running out of time. Uh, but let me just say one last thing, which I promise, I, I, I think I can do it in one minute. OK, so that was the upshot. Uh, oh, and when n is 1, namely when tau is i, the one form symmetry is trivial, that's z1, and d reduces to an invertible global symmetry. That's the ordinary s-duality defect, or the z4 symmetry that people talk about. OK, um, one last example. Really, just one minute. 4 dn equals to 4. Super young males. And let's, for simplicity, take the gauge group to be SU2. The theory has a Z2 one form global symmetry. And when you gauge Z2 one form global symmetries, it gives you, gives you the SO3 super young males. That's the first element. So 40 n close to 4 super young males is not invariant under gauging the Z21 form symmetry. We have to do better. Similar to above, the second ingredient is S duality. It says that the SO3 super young males at tau is isomorphic to the SU2 super young males at minus 1 over tau. Very importantly, when you do S-duality, you change the global structure of the gauge group. But you change it in the same way as gauging the Z21 point symmetry. So now we are in, in, in good shape. At tau equals to i, you can start with SU2, and you first gauge the Z21 point symmetry. But you land on SO3. 
And then you do S duality, which maps tau equals to i back to itself. But the S duality changes the global structure of the gauge group to SU2. And therefore, the SU2 super Young Mills at tau equals to i is isomorphic to its gauge version. And therefore, we have a non-invertible symmetry uh, for in SU2 super Young Mills at tau equals to i. This symmetry, the S duality defect, was discussed for a long time. But the new input we would like to add is that it's not an invertible symmetry, rather it's a non-invertible symmetry. And I see Oliver already standing up, so I'm going to <laughs> shut up. Thank you. So it is already five past, and I want to give people time who need to do something before the banquet at Koenig, time to do that. So let's just, I'm sure there are questions. Let's hold them for, you can, you know, get them by the food tonight and, and ask him or, or ask him tomorrow. So right. let's, uh, let's thank Xu Heng again. Thank you.